This week, we're going to look at Mormon chapters 1 through 6, and there is a list of the record keepers that we reviewed last week. I think it's prudent to uh, briefly discuss them as we see some things about Mormon and how unique he is. First of all, if you just look on our list here on the screen, we have Nephite. Now, this was the Nephite that was alive when the Savior came and visited the, uh, the Nephites in America. It says that he died about 110 AD, and Amos had the record for 84 years, and then he died, which would be 194. That's a very long time. But notice Amos's son, Amos, said he died in 305, and he was the next record keeper. That means he had the records for a very long time. What is that, 116 or 111 years? Uh, so... Obviously, during this very righteous time in the fourth Nephi, you know, following the Savior's time, they lived a lot longer than maybe we do today. So, but Amos died, and he gave the record to his brother, which was Amaron, and he hit up the record in 320 AD. So, again, those two, uh, Amos and, and Amaron and Amos, lived a very, very long time. Now, it says here in Mormon, now we're to the Book of Mormon that's found within the Book of Mormon, that Mormon was about 10 years old. This is verse 2. He was about 10 years old when this Amaron came up to him and said, hey, I've hit up a record. I want you to go find it. And that was 320 AD. A few other things that we learn about Mormon, that at the age of 15, the Lord visited him. By the age of 16, he becomes the, the, the military leader. He gets the record and actually he goes and gets it about 344 AD when he's in his 20s. And then we'll take him up into his 60s when he's a, a leader of the record and he finally takes all the records and, and so forth. So there's a lot going on with this great historian uh, prophet named Mormon. So let's go ahead and dive into the Book of Mormon. If we'll notice that he's speaking from his day, his time, which we're now in... Uh, in uh, in that uh, time period after the Savior. So we know that in verse 2, he's about 10 years old. And it says he learned somewhat after the manner of learning of my people. In other words, he says, I have at least some of an education. But when the military, when you're a military leader by the age of 16, your educational uh, pursuits are probably much in the art of war as well as anything. So in there, in verse 3, it says he's 24 years old. Well, this is where Amaron says, when you're 24, go get the plates. I, I, I've i told you where I've hid them. But it's interesting that in verse 6, that he says, when I, being 11 years old, was carried by my father into the land southward, even to the land of Zarahemla. Now, we know Zarahemla from the days of Mosiah and King Benjamin and so forth is the land northward. So by time we get to Mormon's time period, the Nephites have been kept pushed further north and north and north. And we know that many of them fled to the land north, uh, A, from the Lamanites, and B, there were several times when there was posterity. And people says, I want to go adventure and find and discover new lands. And they went north. So Mormon, who's named after his father Mormon, somehow they were up in the land north. How far? We don't know. It doesn't say. It just says they moved to the land south to Zarahemla. Why? Well, I think there's divine intervention in there where, where the plates are at. He has to go get. So, uh, again, there we've mentioned a couple things. Verse 15, he's visited the Lord at the age of 15. And then after that, he says he couldn't preach. The Lord told him, do not preach to these people uh, because of their wickedness. You know, how wicked are you that you're not allowed to be preached to? Again, this is not ignorance. This is deliberately sinning, like we talked about last week with the son of of perdition. They know better. So let's go to Mormon chapter 2. In verse 9, we learn the name of the king of the Lamanites. His name is King Aaron. We also learn that in verse 2 that he becomes the Lamanite, or excuse me, he becomes the Nephite general. Now, they have battles and go forth a lot, but it's interesting that they're sorrowful in verse 13, but it's not under repentance. Verse 15 is interesting here. The day of grace was past. 
with them. There is an interesting uh, principle that we're given grace, but only for a certain time period. There's a time period if we reject that grace and reject that what's going on, that it is no longer available to us. And we see that here. I wonder if that's, again, a type of what will happen to us in the future here. Now, let's go to verse um, 16 and 17, where in the year 345, it says in verse 17, the city of Jashon was near the land of uh, Amaron, excuse me, the land where Amaron had deposited the records unto the Lord, and they might not be destroyed. So this is where he's going to go, and he's getting the plates and so forth. And he makes a record and so forth. So there's some interesting things there. In verses 27, 28, 29, that area, the Lamanites and Nephites are making a treaty that we're going to take the land north. This is way north. Again, this is not our traditional throughout the history of the Book of Mormon up to this point north. This is north of the narrow neck of land up where we in the past have called the land of desolation. And Mormon refers to that land we're talking above that. So they are really removed north. Now, in chapter 3, it mentions that, in verse 1, 10 years go by where there's not any battles. Now, I did not call this a, la- a time of peace. Remember, peace is not the absence of warfare. In this time, they're preparing for the time of battle. It is a fearful time for these people. And now, in verse 2, the Lord says, Go cry repentance. If they repent, I'll spare them from annihilation. But he shares that, and they don't. And so, for the rest of this chapter, and even the next chapter, there is a message from Mormon to go repent. Now, I'd like you to look at verse, this is chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Here's a great doctrine for us to study about the Lord's apostles. I write unto the ends of the earth, yea, unto you, the twelve tribes of Israel. Again, he's speaking to us. Who shall be judged according to your works by the twelve whom Jesus chose to be his disciples in the land of Jerusalem? So how are we judged? We're judged by the twelve. Now, the next verse adds a layer. I write also unto the remnant of this people. He's talking to the Nephites. Who shall also be judged by the twelve whom Jesus chose in this land. That's the Nephite land. And they shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. So, again, we're going to be judged by the words and the writings of the twelve apostles. So, I just ask myself, do I know what our apostles and prophets are saying? What are they asking us to do? Because I'll be judged by those words. I think there's a great power there. And then verse 22 is a great verse. I would that I could persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Because he knows it's coming. So let's go to chapter 4 now. And you'll see that right at the beginning, we are now at 363 AD. Mormon is not a young man anymore. So he's going to battle out of the land of desolation. So again, the battles now, they keep moving further northward as the Lamanites continue to grow and expand. Verse 5, though, gives me hope. It's not a pleasant verse, but the verse gives me hope. So Mormon chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, the judgments of God will overtake the wicked, but it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. See, I, as a kid, I always thought, oh, God's going to come down and smite the whole world and it's going to be suffering and torment. No, if you recall, yeah, there might be some righteous people that get hurt. I, I'm not discrediting that. But it is the wicked that the God of Israel is going to destroy. And how does he do that? He does it by the wicked. The wicked will destroy the wicked. The reason that the Nephites are being destroyed is because they're wicked. And who's going to do the destruction? It's going to be the Lamites because they're also wicked. Remember, all of them had the fullness of the gospel and lived in harmony for more than 100 years, almost 200 years after the coming of Christ in the visiting the Americas. But the wicked will destroy the wicked. I don't see that being any different in the latter days. So if we're righteous, we gather where we're supposed to gather and keep the covenants that God has made with us, then we will be spared from the wicked destroying the wicked. 
I, I like that verse. That gives me at least hope to be righteous. Let's take a look at a few more verses. Verse 14 is not a pleasant verse. That again, that they are doing human sacrifices, women, children, and so forth. It is not a pleasant time, and it's not going to get any better, as we'll see when we get to the, uh, the book of Moroni. Uh, we see that in verse 6, uh, verse 12, uh, there's battles. Uh, Mormon starts his writing. He's not writing when he's in his 20s. He's the commander of the Lamanites, or the Nephite army against the Lamanites. He writes when he's older. In this case, we know it's 3880. He's age 60. So he takes the records in verse 23 at the age of 55. But he starts writing and he's keeping record at, at least by the age of 60 when he's older. A uh, little, uh, little history there that I think is helpful. Uh, chapter 6, verse 2, we hear the name for the first time, Camorra. It's a land, a hill, where he's going to hide up these records. And at this time, he's 64 years old. So put that in perspective, 64 years old. Verse 6, we see that there's, uh, the year is, uh, what is that in verse 6? 380th year. Uh, again, he's not young in this case. And then there's battles going on. Now, in verse 9, he says, I'm writing a small abridgment. Uh, so here he's going to take a little record. So he has all of these records, but he's writing his own record now and telling the story. And he's going to give this to his son. And in verse 22, or excuse me, verse 12, this is chapter 5, verse 12. Oh, actually, let's go to... Uh, Chapter 6, verse 12. I'm sorry. Chapter 6, verse 12. It says, And we also beheld the 10,000 of my people who were led by my son Moroni. Now, I want you to see the numbers here and what they're going to do here. Uh, he loses 10,000 soldiers. Moroni loses 10,000 soldiers. And I'll give you all of these uh, verses here. Let me help you with this study here. I flip over my scriptures. He loses 10,000 in verse 10. His son in verse 12 that I just read. In verse 14, they list several other men who are leaders of 10,000. And then in verse 15, there are another 10 men. So if I did my math right, there's 230,000 men. That's more than a quarter of a million warriors gone. In verse 15, there's only 24 left. You go from a quarter million to 24. That's it. And then here's his great plea in verses 17. O ye fair ones, how could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? Remember, in Mormon's life, it has gone from he was a young boy. He received a record. The time wasn't good, but he has a quarter of a million soldiers that he's going to lose just in this last great battle here. And he calls them fair sons and daughters. And he looks back and he just, he's reading this record that he has reviewed. Uh, and he's making his own abridgment. And he says, what did we lose? Just his own, you could go back to his own grandfather who was living in that righteous time of peace. Maybe even his own father. And then in his time, it's uh, wicked destroying the wicked. And there's no one left. Next time, we will go and we will discuss uh, chapters 7, 8, and 9 in Mormon. And we will read some of his great words. As well as he will give the record over to uh, his son Moroni. And Moroni will share some words next week. So we'll see you then.